对对对，因为。Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to International Online Conference on COVID-19 Health and Humanities. Our subject for today's conference is talking about ethical guide guidelines for COVID-19 containment measures. Let's welcome Professor Xiao Xichen to give us the opening remarks. Hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the uh, College of Public Health National Taiwan <laughs> Universities, again, I'm so glad we have a second online meeting after the April meetings. And uh, I think this is so important. Uh, on uh, April meeting, we already have uh, some, you know, a very important conclusion about how people can have a new order life. But after two months, there are many emerging issues, you know, arising from this crisis. You know, when containing the COVID-19 pandemic with uh, various measures, such as a lockdown and the social distance, from January until June, you know, the effort we already made to facilitate the globalization on every aspect, including politics, economics, education, academical enterprise, and so on, over the past two decades, seems far from this crisis. So I read, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the point from uh, Professor, you know, uh, Roland, you know, this is a, seems as a bit of the deglobalizations. So this is so important. And uh, why is that? Because, so many, you know, containment measures, and uh, they produce a lot of the issues which are controversial, actually, from different uh, viewpoints. This include the debate. The debates include the conflict between the collective benefit and the individual autonomies, particular with respect to the value of whether to adopt these containment measures. And different countries have a different uh, have a different uh, value and attitude. And also, when you doing the uh, digital contact tracing with the development of APP, you have a lot of problem with uh, privacy, equity, and fairness for peoples. And of course, when people have a test for COVID nineteen, and uh, we also propose something like the immune passport. But you have to have the con ethical considerations. Otherwise, it's very dangerous. And also, for those digital technology, for contact tracings, if you don't consult with uh, the, the, uh, the ethical consideration, then there must be there's sometimes a waste of resources. So in terms of the cost, in terms of the uh, humanity viewpoint, we think this, uh, this is a, this, uh, the new technology should be uh, considered very, very, you know, uh, 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 carefully. And you know, recently I have been consulted with the, uh, the human new challenge of patient. You know, this is even, you know, controversial uh, in terms of the uh, 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 ethical uh, viewpoint. And uh, also, we have already seen in some, in some country, you have uh, insufficient ventilator ICU bed in the face of you know, enormous demand for the infected COVID-19 case. I think Professor uh, An will, will give a lecture later on, but uh, you know, this is also a quite of the ethical issue uh, uh, from such kind, of, uh, such kind of problem. And more important, we are also faced with the economic crisis and unemployment you know, issues as a result of the failure of the uh, food uh, production and supply chain in terms of the food and basic need for life. So I think for all these uh, issues, we already experienced, you know, particularly from March until so far. And now we want to ease the social distance. 
for every in every in in in, in different country regions. So I think humility is so important. Humility is always the cradle for a globalization. So it is time, you know, to ask not only the uh, epidemiologists, not only the public health professionals or the medical professional, we also have to embrace in the discipline professional involved in facing in uh, fighting against this crisis. Otherwise, you know, a, we are going to face with so many controversial issues. So that's why we have this meeting, and uh, and uh, particular as Bin Zhen, I read his her note. Epidemiologist with the humanities, you should have the anthropologist. How about that? You know, so. So I think, you know, uh, 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 we are very fortunate to have such kind of online meetings. And uh, Taiwan is also one of the country in support of the, uh, the humanity uh, to uh, facilitate the collaborations in order to, uh, uh, to develop the sustainable development goal uh, as WHO already set up. So I, I'm so great on behalf of the uh, College of Public of National Taiwan, Taiwan University, you know, to host, you know, these uh, uh, online meetings with all the experts from different uh, disciplines. And uh, I wish, you know, we have, uh, we have, uh, <coughs> we have very, very uh, 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 fruitful uh, uh, discussion after the uh, Professor Ang's uh, uh, speech. So uh, thank you so much again for joining with our meetings and for all the audience from the world, you know, mm -hmm. around the world uh, to see our live show. And I want you to uh, participate together to listen to all the experts from this field, you know, uh, to, uh, to listen to their advice uh, about how do we face with these uh, 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 COVID-19 <coughs> pandemics. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you again for our experts involved in this meeting. And I also uh, express my uh, particular you know, gratitude toward the Professor uh, Bin Zhen Xiong and also Professor Louis Se. He, they both always uh, our mentors you know, to uh, support this meeting to move forward. And we are going to a series of meetings, not only in the, the uh, April and the June meeting. We are going to a series of meetings to emphasize you know, the the uh, humanity viewpoint, you know, for uh, for uh, for COVID nineteen, you know, uh, the subject. And thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Chen. So now we are going to our keynote speech, and here we also invite Professor Chen to chair this section. Okay, uh, I think the <coughs> yeah. Let me introduce uh, Professor Anne Gallifo. You know, Professor Anne Gallifo. You know, she is an expert in. Uh, in <coughs> in <coughs> healthcare ethicals and also particular on the nation uh, uh, ethicals, and he's a she's a chief in editor in nation ethicals uh, for long time, and I I think she she been involved in uh, uh, ethical issues for facilitating you know the global health and also public health and also medical ethical nursing ethical for for long time. And uh, I, this time, I particular ask her to suggest the two articles and the one book for, uh, for, for becoming our suggested article for readings before and after the uh, meetings. And uh, she's now is uh, uh, the Director of International Care Ethicals of the Veterinary University of Surrey. UK uh, professors. I think 
per topical today is so important. You know, from her topical titles, you know, slow ethical is the key word I pick up from uh, her uh, her talk, and uh, there's a there's always a problem when I learn in the driving. Slow driving is always you know uh, difficult than the fast driving. You know, so I think uh, she going she's going to provide a very very important and valuable uh, talk on a slow approach to the pandemicals, a view from care ethicals. So Anne, Professor Anne, please. My screen, so I hope this works. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Yes, fantastic, great. Okay, so so thank you. It is an honor to take part, and I thank you, Professor Chen and Professor uh, Ping Chen, also for making this conversation possible. It has never been more important for international engagement about these very important issues. Um, you mentioned in your talk that we have a new order life, and this is very true. We, we talk here in the UK, new normal. New normal is the very common way we refer to our current situation. We are all having to get used to different ways of working. Um, can I say, please stop me if you if if uh, if I'm not being heard properly or anything. Please do um, interrupt me uh, sure. or, or indeed if anyone wants to sure. ask do, anything. Yeah. Um, I, Professor Chen, you've already mentioned some of the big ethical issues, for example, between autonomy and and the the general good, um, the the interests of the many, as it were. So this is a very important point during the pandemic. Uh, what I want to do is, that, as you said, I've just finished a work on a book uh, from my sabbatical on slow ethics and the art of care. And some of that work was inspired by my time at um, the University of Xiamen in China and also in Japan. So I have a very strong affiliation and respect for Eastern culture. However, I need you colleagues to please also help me to apply this framework better from an Eastern perspective and a multidisciplinary perspective. So what I want to do in this talk is just give you some introduction to the idea of slow and slow ethics and the story behind the background to slow ethics. So um, some years ago in 2013, I was in Stockholm at the National Museum. And it was a time in the UK when we had a lot of care scandals and one in particular, there was a hospital called the Mid Staffordshire Hospital. And they reported that about 400 patients had died unnecessarily because of lack of care, because of lack of good care. So at the time, there was a lot of what we might call moral panic. And um, I guess it's very similar to the current time when we have a lot of panic about the pandemic. So at the exhibition on slow art, I learned about, I was introduced to the idea of slow. And you can see here a necklace, which is made of eggshells and gold thread, which is very, very beautiful. And at the um, exhibition, this, this text uh, was presented and it said that uh, slow art is about perspectives that focus on doing things well instead of quickly, on value and quality instead of quantity on handling materials or common natural resources with care and showing consideration for future generations. It's on seeing a value in slow, slowness, on allowing time to be a significant factor in the artistic process. So it's not just about speed, it's about quality, it's about thinking about things differently. And in my recent work, I describe the movement, the slow movement, and there's a Canadian called Carl Honore. He was one of the first to write about the slow movement. But you may have heard of slow food. Colleagues in Italy, for example, that's where the slow food uh, movement began. It was a, a backlash. It was a response to fast food, as you can imagine. So again, it was about food that was locally sourced, that we had quality, that was uh, prepared slowly. And we paid attention to um, where our products come from. 
and also there's been a lot of uh, recent literature on, uh, as I said, slow cities, uh, slow travel, slow medicine, we've also slow nursing. And as I said, the exhibition I attended was about slow art. So the, the literature at the exhibition, I found it very inspiring. And as I said, at the time, people wanted things done quickly. There was moral panic. There was an idea that you needed to respond quickly. Um, but this, um, this was the, the uh, person who wrote the um, introduction to the slow art movement and Silla Roback, who said, thus it requires not only courage, but also integrity to dare to take the time and focus entirely on one single project for weeks, months, or even years. Now, we don't always have this much time, but the point is it's about quality. It's not making assumptions that good things can be done quickly. And of course, we see during the pandemic, Professor Chen pointed out to me that at the moment there's a, a rush to publish and do research quickly. But of course, we have to also do things well. So after the um, exhibition in Stockholm, I came back to the UK. I ordered all the books I could on slow, and then I began to write some articles. So this first one was for Times Higher Education, and then I wrote an article for Clinical Ethics. And then I, I said in, in that article that slow ethics requires a broader view of ethical competence that pays attention to ethical perception, the acquisition of knowledge of moral philosophy and other related disciplines to understand ethical and unethical practice. The development of critical thinking is about ethical action and the conditions that enable professionals to flourish ethically and to demonstrate the virtues. And I go on and I say that slow ethics provides the opportunity for a more sustainable approach to professional ethics. It resists seduction by quick fixes, uh, to quick fix solutions, complacency by the latest ethical concordat, charter or algorithm, and reassurance from, pub from simple explanations for unethical practice. And I suppose if there's anything to sort of encapsulate this work is the moral life is not simple and it's not fast, it's complex, the moral life is complex, and we need to take time, and here I say, to listen carefully and to judge slowly. So ethical issues in the pandemic, uh, I'm involved here in the UK, and I know many other colleagues will be also in their countries, in a number of ethics committees. And the last few months, we've been very busy uh, considering a wide range of ethical questions. Now, the big one that relates to this conference today is what should governments do to curtail infection? And this raises issues about liberty, civil liberties, and also issues about autonomy. And, and what, what is it legitimate, ethical for governments to do to stop infection? Now, we see in China, for example, that there has been lockdown in various areas, and all of our countries have different forms of quarantine. Um, and in, in Ireland, interestingly, they use the word cocooning, people being cocooned, uh, which, is, uh, which is quite interesting. So every government has different, it seems, approaches. And we look to um, colleagues in other countries who seem to be doing better, certainly than the UK in recent times. A second question is, what are the obligation of citizens? This pandemic, uh, for the first time, every human, ethics is not an optional extra. Every single human on our planet, in our globe, in our global community, is a potential victim of COVID-19 or a potential vector. That is someone who can infect others and cause harm to others. So suddenly there may have been a time when people thought ethics was something that was, in the, was the responsibility of others. Now for every human on, in our global community, we have obligations, responsibilities to others. And we also, have obligations to keep ourselves safe and our loved ones. More uh, sort of healthcare related issues that I, uh, Professor Chen has already mentioned, when resources are limited, who gets the intensive care bed or the ventilator? Again, here in the UK, and I think probably in your countries, there was a lot of concern and anxiety that there would be more people than resources. So there would be more sick people than ICU beds or ventilators. And different healthcare organizations were arriving at different methods to triage, to make decisions about the allocation of these scarce resources. And that is very difficult. And there was also a lot of concern about ageism 
that people would be discriminated against on the basis of aid. So, for example, older people might be disadvantaged, which I know was an area of interest for colleagues in this conversation today. And also there was concern that people with disabilities might be disadvantaged or discriminated against. So we had the challenge of possibly, possibly ageism and disabledism, and there may have been other factors as well. So one of the other professional ethics questions is when there's insufficient PPE is personal protective equipment. So it means masks and clothing to protect the worker, gloves and so on. So one of the big questions that we have been discussing locally is when there is insufficient personal protective equipment, do professionals have a duty to care? Now, in, in the UK, one of the nursing organisations has a document called a Guidance on Refusal to Care During the Pandemic. I think this is a very controversial issue that a doctor or a nurse would ever feel it was appropriate to refuse to care. Uh, however, that is not totally agreed. Some people think that if they don't have the proper equipment, they do have a right to refuse to care. And I'd be interested in the views of colleagues uh, at this conference um, on, on that particular situation. So we've had in response to this, certainly here in the UK, we have had so many frameworks, so many ethical frameworks. Um, I said we have a, a tsunami of value statements, and I think it is sometimes very difficult for professionals, for nurses, doctors, and other healthcare professionals to make decisions and to know which values should be uh, the most important. So this is just one example. This is from the British, uh, the United Kingdom, a British Medical Association. And these are the values that they propose that should underpin ethical decision-making during the pandemic, particularly when resources are scarce and we have to make these hard decisions. So the first uh, value here is about equal respect. So I, I suppose you might think about a utilitarian approach and everyone counts for one and no, or no one for more than one. So everyone should be considered equally. There should be equal respect for all, regardless of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, age, uh, disability, and so on. Also, we should respect, and of course the word autonomy is relevant here. However, as we heard in the introduction, Respect for autonomy is challenging because in the, during a pandemic, it's about a community, it's about, a, about group issues rather than the rights of individuals. I mean, hopefully these things will coincide, but respect for autonomy is not the paramount value during a pandemic, it's more utilitarian. We need to minimize the harm of the pandemic and globally in all of our countries, that has been the priority of governments minimizing the harm. And as you well know, there is a cost there is a cost because protecting the, well, the health and well-being of our communities, our fellow global citizens, also has an economic cost. And we now see an opening up in our different countries. And this is a very fine balance between economic um, uh, prosperity or even um, just um, resilience, I guess, survival, and also uh, the health of the nation. So, this is a very uh, challenging ethical um, balancing uh, situation. Fairness is important. Again, non-discrimination or at least discrimination that can be justified. Working together is important. And that's why this kind of conference is so important. None of us in our individual countries have all of the answers. So we need to share our expertise and experience and help each other. The value uh, of solidarity, of course, is very relevant there. And I will come back to that shortly. Reciprocity is a value that the British Medical Association proposed as very important. And the idea is that if we expect healthcare professionals to do good work and to care well for patients, particularly at this time, patients with COVID-19, they should also be protected. There should be a reciprocal relationship. So healthcare organizations should also protect care workers as they deliver care to patients. Because of course, as we know, there is risk particularly to some groups of um, care workers. Again, I will return to that. We need to be flexible. Our decision making needs to be open and transparent. That's a very strong ethical imperative. Again, here in the UK, and you can tell me in your countries, there has been a lot of anxiety that governments are making decisions based on uh, unethical grounds, for example, based on ageist and per perhaps disabledist um, uh, rationale, which is, is very uh, problematic. So 
governments, of course, would say this is not the case, but still the population, people may be anxious that there is some discrimination. So our decision making needs to be open and transparent. And the hospitals I work with, they publish their ethical frameworks on their website so uh, local communities can see the values that underpin their decision making. So, um, so, I mean, this is a question for you. I would be interested in our roundtable discussion if you would like to share the values frameworks in Taiwan and other countries. And are these values similar, the same, different? So maybe we can return to this in our conversation after my talk. So there's been a lot of uh, media. I'm just going to show you some media attention to the pandemic issues in the UK and, and in other countries as well. So uh, until recently, every, every third uh, a, a situation we call clapping for care. So people went on the street and clapped for healthcare uh, workers. Now, some people don't like this idea of heroes. People say, I am just doing my job. I'm not a hero. But nevertheless, in the way for the first time in the UK, healthcare workers have received a lot of respect and gratitude. And that is not usual. Often, sadly, these workers are taken for granted. But as well as that, it says, don't just applaud them, give them PPE. So this is a very important point that uh, there, there are campaigns to make sure that our healthcare workers are protected. So again, PPE is personal protective equipment. It's the masks and gloves and gowns that protects the workers. So this has been a, um, a campaign that's run alongside the Clapping for Cares. One thing that you may or may not know, but is there, a, there is a disproportionately high number of people from, as we call BAME, so Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups who've been um, uh, suffered more greatly through the pandemic. So, for example, in healthcare workers who have died, I don't know all the statistics. The International Council of Nursing says that 600 nurses globally have died, but clearly there are many more doctors and other professionals. But many of those people who have died have been from Black, Asian, minority ethnic groups. We don't quite know all the reasons for that, but this is a very important consideration that colleagues from these backgrounds are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And this is very important research that we need to um, understand better. And in terms of uh, government imperatives, uh, the UK, of course, and as your other countries, we've had we've had a lockdown quarantine, and this was the um, sort of the mantra, you know, stay safe, stay home, save. Uh, protect our NHS, our National Health Service. So, and people generally have been very compliant and we're now opening up. So it will be interesting to see what will happen after that. We are looking to other countries. So for example, to Korea, and also I think this one is for us from Taiwan. We're looking to countries who have done better, certainly in terms of testing. The UK record has not been very impressive. We have had too many deaths and testing was introduced very, very late. And uh, so basically, all governments are under scrutiny. Did they do the right thing? Was their approach ethical? Did they wait too long? And I should say, from an ethical point of view, one of my concerns has been in many countries that it was the elder care sector who were neglected. So, uh, for example, the care home sector in many of our countries, people thought about the care home sector too late. So they were very good at responding to the needs of hospitals, intensive care units, but they overlooked the needs of care homes. And sadly, some, some hospitals were discharging patients to the care home sector, and we had a very high death rate of our elder uh, citizens in care homes because um, they were thought about too late. So that is definitely an ethical concern and something that was, was not right. So the important thing is hopefully we can learn for this. People say that this is a, an era of pandemics. This is not the first pandemic. It will not be the last. So from an ethical point of view, we need to learn and need to do better next time. Uh, you may remember our Prime Minister, um, Boris Johnston, he contracted COVID-19 and was in an intensive care unit and was very, very grateful. So certainly his experience uh, drew attention to the fantastic work of nurses and doctors in our intensive care unit. And this is just an example from Canada. We, I know we have some Canadian colleagues in this. So globally, this has been an issue. It's an issue that's brought all of us together and hopefully we can, will continue to learn from each other. Certainly the UK has not done as well as many other countries and hopefully we'll learn from this for the future. 
So um, in my uh, recent work, I talk about the art of care. Care is what I've been engaged in for the last four decades and more. And in my book, I refer to Donald Sean's work, Educating the Reflective Practitioner. And I really like this quote. I won't read all of it, but it's very, I think it's a very insightful approach to professional practice, which is not simple and it's not fast. And he says, in the very topography of professional practice, there's a high hard ground overlooking a swamp. On the high ground, manageable problems lend themselves to solution through the application of, um, sorry, through the application of research-based theory and technique. In the swampy lowlands, messy, confusing problems defy technical solution. The irony of this situation is that the problems of the hard high ground tend to be relatively unimportant to individuals or society at large, while in the swamp lie the problems of greatest human concerns. And I hope uh, you can see why that would resonate. We are in a way in, in a context of swampy lowlands. There is so much uncertainty and unpredictability during this pandemic. So it's very important not to imagine that our randomized control trials will do all the work we need. In fact, the humanities have never been more important. And there is some uh, material here. I will. I am happy for uh, these slides to be made available um, after, and I will send uh, Professor Chen the updated versions. This was updated this morning. So anyway, um, in relation to the uh, slow art um, exhibition and uh, my concern about fast ethics, I arrived at these elements of slow ethics. And maybe as I go through, you will see why hopefully they make sense to you and they might be useful during this pandemic. So the six elements, my six S's as it were, are firstly stories, sensitivity, space, scholarship, solidarity and sustainability. And I start with the idea of stories, and, and many of you will know the wonderful work of Canadian colleague um, Arthur Frank, uh, and this is a wonderful book called Letting Stories Breathe, um, Associate um, Socio-Narratology. And he says that stories work with people and always, uh, sorry, for people, and always stories work on people, affecting what people see as real as possible, as worth doing or best avoid it. And a question for you that I won't have time to answer, but you might want to think about that. What stories help us to better respond to this pandemic? And I would say, listening to the stories of patients, of families. And one of the things that has been very distressing in the UK and maybe in your countries is that many people have had to die without their families by their side. And that's a very, very difficult and challenging ethical situation. And many nurses and doctors, of course, have been doing very good work to try and make a connection between families and patients when they cannot be together, particularly at the end of life. But there are many stories. We need to also hear the stories of doctors, nurses, other professionals, and indeed, uh, perhaps also people in policy and government. So a lot of stories can help us better understand and better respond to the pandemic. Um, the second S is sensitivity, which is about understanding what people need and being kind and helpful. And there are various definitions. It's about awareness of how our actions affect other people, the capacity to recognize ethical issues and decide with intelligence and compassion. It is not either or. We need to think well as well as feel well and, and have our right ethical sensitivities. So I have a question about how ethical sensitivity can impact on responses to the pandemic. And it does relate to stories. Stories help to develop our ethical sensitivity and to not be so focused, so blind. There's a phenomenon called moral blindness where people are not able to see the wider ethical uh, implications. So that's the second S, sensitivity. The third S is space and time. I won't read all of this. Um, in the book, I talk about moral reflective space. Uh, and it's very important to have space to think and read and reflect. One of the, the issues that characterized care scandals here was what I would call forgetfulness. People seem to forget what had gone before. And in this pandemic, as I said, this is not the first pandemic. We've had SARS, we've had Ebola and other pandemics, and it seems we sometimes forget the wisdom that has gone before. So we need to learn and we need to take the space and time to reflect on, on that. And we need to have time to talk with our peers and our colleagues. For example, this conference is a way to have more reflective space to consider these very, very important ethical issues. 
this was a project we did, I won't read this, where we brought people together. And these, pe these people were caregivers and they, uh, they had the, the um, assumed the role of care recipients for a weekend to see what it felt like to be a patient. And it was very, very impactful. Scholarship is the next area. And there's a lot of scholarship in, in applied ethics that you, of course, will probably know about. And there's a wide range of themes that relate to the pandemic. People are experiencing moral distress. Moral distress is where people feel they know the right thing to do, but they are unable to do it. Moral resilience is something we have seen a lot of. We see staff who hold on to their values and they do the right thing no matter what, no matter how difficult the circumstances, they will make the time to be with the patient at the end of life. They will make the time to communicate with families and so on. So moral resilience is a very important concept at this time during the pandemic. The moral climate of the healthcare organization, it is very important. Ethics has moved on. There was a time when ethics focused on good and bad people. Now we think about culture and climate. We think about the, the, the moral climate, the ethical climate of healthcare organizations. And of course, if the culture is good and the climate is good, there is more chance that the workers will do the right thing and they'll be supported to do the right thing. There's also a lot of work on dignity and care, which relates to the pandemic. Dignity is about the worth and value of every individual human. There's been attention to pandemic, issues about truth telling, consent. What does it mean to be an ethically competent practitioner at this time? And of course, much more attention to um, ethics education. And here, a question to this group is scholarship from other disciplines. How can this help us to understand the pandemic? And I know we have colleagues here from history, architecture, politics, sociology, psychology, philosophy and so on. So I think understanding issues relating to the pandemic, it's not just about applied ethics or philosophy. Indeed, we need a wide range of disciplinary perspectives or lenses so we can understand better. Um, so um, clearly in terms of ethics, there's a lot of different approaches, virtue ethics, care ethics, rights-based ethics and so on. So just a question for you that I, I will certainly not intend to answer is what scholarship informs the ethics of pandemic responses? Is there a values and evidence base for what you do, for what we do. And just uh, this morning, I was very grateful that Professor Chen sent me this. And one thing that I have neglected, certainly in my book, I do have a chapter on Japan in sense and sensitivity, but I have not looked uh, in any detail at uh, Chinese uh, Eastern scholarship. So um, Professor Chen sent me this very lovely Chinese proverb that I think uh, is very, resonates beautifully with slow ethics, soft fire makes sweet mold, and you can read it. In, in Chinese, I wouldn't even attempt to do that. So thank you very much, Professor Chen, for doing, sending that. I, one of the uh, examples in the book is about um, um, sen insensitivity. It's about Japan, uh, about the role of tea and teaism, which uh, I really enjoyed engaging with the scholarship, and also the value of harmony, which is not something we discuss very much in the West. I think it is a very important role at all times and of course also during the pandemic so again thank you and more work to be done in terms of an eastern uh, perspective on slow in relation to the pandemic so thank you um solidarity is the next s uh, solidarity is critically important and at this time during the pandemic um and in in the recent work i did on eastern uh, perspective on slow in relation okay i uh, Thank you. I, I think I caught a little bit. I hope we can come back to this um, in, in our conversation after. So, so thank you. Um, so um, solidarity, uh, this chapter was work I did at uh, Tuskegee and, uh, and the, the, um, you probably will know about the, uh, the United States public health um, syphilis study at Tuskegee, which raised lots of very, very challenging issues about unethical practice and research. So solidar solidarity was, is a very important value. And in relation to uh, research, uh, it re refers to relationships, human, 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 non-human, human in the environment. And if there's another thing that, that this uh, situation has done, it's made, it is much more mindful of environmental issues. And that is, is very, very important, very good. It's also about the relationship between human and technology. It reflects a collective commitment to appreciate benefits and share costs with a view to promoting the flourishing of care recipients, caregivers in the present and in the future. So solidarity is a very, very important value at this time. We have never needed to be more together than we, we do need to be now. So again, this conference is, is a very good um, movement in that direction. Sustainability, 
Um, there, clearly, there's a lot of um, attention now to sustainability. And one of my insights from the work, and I think the pandemic too, people seem to forget that we need to look to the long term. So I just ask the question, what does this have to do with pandemic responses? And again, you can see there's a lot of literature on uh, the ethical significance of the sustainability of care relationships, rarely receives uh, attention and is unlikely to be labeled catastrophic. So my point is that we need to consider relational sustainability. And, and clearly we also have our, um, our global goals in relation to uh, sustainability. I've also, in relation to this, I talk about love. Um, and it's a challenging one in professional ethics because people think well, love, love has no place in professional life. We need to think about our boundaries. So I'm least suggesting that uh, maybe we need to pay more attention to love in relation to also our uh, global um, sustainability. And this was some work I did some years ago with a vet in relation to the role of love in relationships between um, professionals and uh, care recipients. So just to, um, try, I'm coming up to, I've got a few, just a few minutes left. So I'm just going to uh, now draw some conclusions and then I very much look forward to your uh, responses. So I've detailed uh, the six X. This was a, a picture I, I came across uh, when I was in um, uh, Kyoto, that may be of interest. Um, so to, just to draw some conclusions, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic necessitates an ethical as well as a scientific response and as I said, we, we, know, we know this, everyone on, the, on our planet now in our global community is aware that ethics is not an esoteric academic discipline. It is a reality for all of us. Each of us is, um, it's, we, as I said, it's not an, an optional extra. Every human is a potential victim of COVID-19 and also a vector. That means that we have responsibilities to keep ourselves safe, but also not to harm other humans. And in fact, we now have the potential, if we're not cautious, if we're not mindful, if we don't behave ethically, we can actually pass on an infection that can effectively kill other humans. So this is a huge responsibility. And all of us in all of our countries are thinking about good ways, ethical ways to maintain safety and to make sure that as we move into the future, we'll be better prepared also for future pandemics. And it's again, that issue of sustainability and slow is, is very, very pertinent. Um, I've said here ethical issues um, sorry, need to be engaged in. There's a type of they need to be engaged in at all levels. So during the pandemic, it's not just policymakers and politicians. So it's everyone. So the micro level is about individuals. It's individual human to human. It's about our critically our relationships. So the micro issues, the micro level is very, very important. Then we have the meso level, the organizational issues. Our organizations, our healthcare organizations, our schools, our universities, they have to consider, those organizations have to consider what is best for uh, the, the, the most people. And that's very challenging. And clearly, this last few weeks in the UK, we've had lots of heated discussion about schools and the health and well-being of our young people. Uh, so on the one hand, clearly, people want to ensure that people are, remain safe. But on the other hand, there is now a recognition that keeping our young people away from school is damaging and harmful in the long term. And also it raises issues of social inequalities. Clearly it is the case as usual that whenever people are more deprived and more disadvantaged, they will suffer more from our responses to the pandemic. So the meso issues are very, very important. And the macro is the political, the higher level, the global, the WHO, our politicians. And sadly, not all, all of our politicians have done very well. Not all of the decision making has been very good or very ethical. Um, but for the most part, I think we might agree that in most countries, governments are doing the best they can. And we can certainly look at um, examples of countries that have been doing very, very well in terms of responses to the pandemic. Uh, so I'm thinking, for example, maybe South Korea. Clearly, you'll tell me more about Taiwan. I'm thinking also about New Zealand. There's many countries that are doing very, very well and others that are maybe catching up a little bit late. So um, just to sort of conclude, um, my argument overall is that a slow ethics approach, uh, approach enables us to consider carefully uh, the role of stories, first of all, the role of sensitivity, the role of moral and reflective space, the role of scholarship. We need not to be forgetful. We need to learn from the past as we move into the future. And we need to think about sustainability. And as I said, one of the most important values 
uh, again, I think it's it's um, it, it sort of reinforced by a conversation like this and a global conference like this organized by uh, the university in Taiwan. Uh, solidarity is really, really important in our responses to this global emergency. So I'm going to finish there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for Professor Carlefo and uh, Anne. Your, your talk is so useful, I think. Uh, you know, the six S element of slow ethical, I think, is actually quite useful. I can immediately have a response to this. Some of the, uh, one of the elements, uh, solidarity already applied to the vaccine trial, you know. So this is so important because so many vaccine candidates right now, if we don't have a solitary platform, we have a platform, we, our vaccine development will be very, very you know, late. So I just have a response to uh, your framework about six S element. And uh, I'm, I, 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 we, we think we learned so much about this uh, speech. And uh, also, I think, you know, yeah, you are, all, you, you, are, you are absolutely right, you know. Whenever you have seen so many uh, research and the paper published in the biomedical research and also uh, epidemiology research, you can see uh, we have to stop for a while to think about whether, you know, ethical consideration are so important for our, you know, peoples. So I think a... Uh, I, I appreciate this talk so much, so uh, thank you so much again, and uh, 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 I hope, you know, your, your talk will navigate uh, the next, the round table uh, discussions. Uh, you already uh, raised uh, several questions, and I will follow this question to ask our uh, expert, you know, uh, from the uh, panelists uh, to uh, have a uh, discussion and uh, also uh, to talk about that. So again, thank you so much uh, for your talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, you know, we are we are going to uh, go to the next section about roundtable discussions after uh, the guidance from the professor. Uh, Professor Ann uh, Gallifo, uh speech. So uh, I think uh, uh, before we have uh, uh, we have a we have a talk about uh, the subject. I ask our organizer, you know, Grace, to introduce the each of the experts uh, in order to make our audience, you know, clearly, you know, know uh, what. Uh, expert we invite uh, on these online meetings. So Grace, can you can you can you follow this? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in this roundtable discussion, we are talking about guidelines for COVID nineteen content management, privacy, and equality and fairness. Here we invite nine distinguished professors to join this discussion. The first expert is Professor Anne Gallagher. Now she is a professor of ethics and care and director of International Care Ethics Observatory at University of Surrey in UK and also the chief editor of Nursing Ethics. Her research fields are in philosophical and empirical ethics as part of care, medicine, and veterinary practice. Let's welcome Professor Ann Gallagher to join us. <laughs> and the second expert is Professor Louis Ustervik. He is a chairholder of United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization in humanities and cultural integrated landscape management, and also the director of the Museum of 
prehistory art in Marco. His research fields are in archaeology, hit, hit, uh, hero, uh, heritage, and landscape management, uh, prehistory, origins of food pro production, human mobility patterns, and museum study. Let's welcome Professor Louis Oosterbeek. And our third expert is Professor Xiong Bing Zhen. She is the president of Asian New Humanities Network and the chair of the International Council for Philosophy and Human Sciences on New Humanities at University of California at Auburn. Her research fields are in late empirical and modern China, comparative culture, and social history history of children and pedi pediatric medicine, public health, society, technology and medical medicine, and Russian cultural and intellectual history. Let's welcome Professor Xiong Bing Zhen. <laughs> and our next expert is Professor Ma Yonghui. Now she is an assi uh, Associate Professor on Medical Ethics or Bioethics and Associate Director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics at the School of Medicine of Xiamen University in China. Her research fields are in medical ethics, bioethics, genetic ethics, clinical ethics, ethics of new biomedical and cross-cultural uh, cross bioethics, Let's welcome Professor Ma Yonghui. <laughs> the next expert is Professor Roran Tiso. He is a professor of contemporary history at the University of New Chart, New Chart, New Charter. His research fields are in uh, e economic history, contemporary history, tourism leisure and transport history. Let's welcome Professor Roran Tiso. <laughs> the next expert is Professor Harold Shurson. Uh, he is a professor of Beihan University in China and philosophy of technology and global ethics at Polytechnic uh, Institute of New York University in USA. His research fields are in philosophy of technology, global ethics, comparative philosophy, and engineering and humanities. Let's welcome Professor Harold Schulzen. The next expert is Dr. Zosen Somhegi. He is a chair of the Department of Fine Art at College of Fine Arts and design at University of Sarja in United Arab Emirates. His research fields are in history of aesthetic uh, contemporary fine arts, art market trends, and art communication. Let's welcome Dr. Zoltan Somhegi. And the next expert is Professor Chen Shouxi. He is the Associate Dean of College of Public Health and the Director of Master of Public Health Program at the National Taiwan University. His research fields are in biostatistics, epidemiology, disease screening, and stochastic process. Let's welcome Professor Chen Shouxi. <laughs> and our last expert is Professor Zhang Changquan. He is the Dean of College of Public Health at National Taiwan University. His research fields are in global health, air pollution, environmental epidemiology, and risk analysis. Let's welcome Professor Zhang Changquan. <laughs> so it's our, uh, all our distinguished professors. So now we'll invite Professor Xiu Xichen to chair this roundtable discussion. Uh, thank you so much for Grace for introduction. I think it is necessary to introduce all 
uh, expert involved in the round table discussion because we have a live, live show for the audience from you know around the world and uh, uh, knowing these experts are so important you know uh, in the future uh, uh, in order to have to enrich the knowledge of the humanity and also in the discipline collaboration so particular for the uh, young generation to introduce uh, these uh, experts to understand uh, to, to know them you know so this is our another purpose of online meeting and uh, so I think uh, before uh, before we uh, we go into have a dis uh, uh, to have a discussion about uh, the uh, the point we have already uh, asked the expert to uh, propose uh, and also uh, together with the the the, the point raised by uh, the Ann, you know, talk. Uh, I ask uh, uh, the three, you know, the person uh, to say something about uh, uh, the, the the original of the meeting and uh, the organization of this meeting, to, uh, particular uh, with the cooperation with the ships and and so on. And uh, the first uh, person, I think, I ask. A Binzhen, you know, to say something about how we have this meeting and uh, how we evolve. Because I know experts already know that, but uh, for our audience, they have no idea, you know, how this uh, meeting uh, can be, you know, a, a can be held, you know, a, a from April uh, until uh, June and maybe uh, next series. Binzhen, please. Yeah. yeah. So you. use last mic. No, no, just, just. Oh, okay, okay. Um, good, wonderful. Um, so uh, let me uh, uh, give you a bit of a background uh, and to situate all of our audience and, and colleagues and friends uh, uh, around the world to how we got here. Uh, first of all, um, I must say the uh, College of Public Health at National Taiwan University had invested uh, in a, um, a, a enduring effort uh, to work with humanities. Uh, many uh, of you have mentioned and now realize that uh, with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we will see realignment of disciplines. And just mentioned that, and here you saw that uh, the humanists, uh, not just myself, uh, many on the round table have been here uh, teaching the summer course together, engaged in uh, lasting uh, uh, working relations. Um, you know, we're supported by Dean John and before him many other deans and also Tony taking up uh, this um, uh, very remarkable position. So our original plan about two years ago uh, was to have an international conference that will bring public health and plenary health together with the humanist. Uh, and that was planned for April of uh, this year, 2020. Uh, the preliminary lectures have been given by Luis uh, when he visited um, the island uh, this past fall, actually two falls ago, and uh, some other people. Um, of course, uh, with uh, even uh, the wish to take a longitudinal <laughs> view about time, none of us would realize that we will be hit by this uh, major, major uh, uh, challenge and crisis internationally. Uh, so when we realize that although yeah, everything yeah. is planned, including all of the speakers, yeah. including um, uh, the other colleagues from Southeast Asia, yeah. East Asia joining us, many, many speakers, um, by the winter, this past winter, I think January, February, we realized that an in-person plenary health and humanities uh, meeting would not take place as originally planned. So then we were still, you know, very optimistic, even though we're surrounded by epidemiologists, 
spouse statisticians, <laughs> they're giving briefings um, to the nation and to others every day. Uh, we were still quite uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, happy, uh, cheerful by, I think, early February. We decided that we thought that we would have an in-person meeting, things should be safe by uh, the third week of June. So we identified this date, today and tomorrow, to be the date for the real in-person conference that the April conference would be postponed to. Of course, uh, little that any of us would know, uh, that was not to be the case. Um, you know, by April, you see that the situation in Europe and the situation in North America and now elsewhere, South Asia, um, Africa, Latin America, uh, everywhere. Um, I guess by then, by April, when we had the online meeting, many of us realized that we should take this challenge to be an opportunity to invent or to, to experiment with the new normal, at least intellectually, uh, in the academy. Um, so thus, uh, here we are with, uh, um, I suppose, episode two. Uh, that was the episode one uh, in April. You might actually continue to see us uh, 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 in uh, the fall, in you know August, or in other places, I want to thank um, uh, Tony and the team. I wish that you could, like me, uh, see them in the room. Uh, we are surrounded by a room full of uh, very young uh, colleagues who are very determined, well trained to carry on um, many, many decades and years. Um, beyond us. And I really, really would like to also thank Anne for giving us this very, very timely lecture about the slow movement uh, in the, um, uh, uh, in the uh, later discussions. I would um, also share with you all about this, our, this, uh, our understanding of slow movement um, the slow cinnamon and others. Uh, and also, I hope we got to talk and elaborate on the points that have been raised about uh, realignment of disciplines, about discursive turns, and about uh, uh, the possibility of envisioning a new fresh start for all of us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, Inzhen. And uh, uh, Luis, your turn, yeah. Uh, may I? Yeah, yeah, just, uh, yeah, uh, just, just say something about the organization, yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for uh, having this uh, second uh, very important debate. Uh, I thank very much uh, Professor Anne Gallagher for the great introduction to, to it. Uh, in fact, just to say, apart from what uh, Ping Chen already mentioned, that uh, for SIP, this is a very timely and important uh, discussion. We, we do believe that the debates that uh, have been organized by you and, uh, and uh, Tony Chen will, in the near future, lead to the organization of a major SIPS program in the domain of uh, health and humanities. So probably, I hope, we will be able also to discuss on it uh, uh, today and uh, in the near future. Thank you for the moment. Okay, uh, thank you so much for uh, both, of, uh, both of them. And, uh, the third one, I ask my dean, you know, uh, Chang Xianzhang, uh, to uh, give a briefing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be uh, in this uh, important um, conference online. And uh, National Taiwan University College of Public Health, uh, from the beginning of this uh, pandemic, we have been involved in a lot of activities for our society and uh, 
also for the world. And I, as we are still experiencing this ongoing pandemic, things are changing day by day. You are seeing a lot of things coming and going in one uh, places and, uh, and affecting uh, all sectors of uh, popul populations and sometimes hit hardly on some uh, subset of the populations. And, uh, and you also see so-called the heroes and uh, uh, first line workers who are defending uh, our safety and health. And all this involved in this, um, uh, we call humanity. And, uh, and uh, we uh, from the College of Public Health have seen this uh, shortcomings of uh, only relied on this uh, quantitative approach and try to uh, look at the statistics to make decisions and on uh, uh, very uh, urgent issues. And, uh, and we do need a lot of I input from uh, our friends in social science and uh, humanities. And uh, we did learn a lot from our previous uh, conference uh, back in April, right? Yep. So uh, we are looking forward for today's discussion and hopefully we can uh, learn from each other to, to gain the wisdom we need to defend the humankind against this uh, powerful virus which is uh, killing people every day uh, in the world. So thank you for participating in this and I look forward for this roundtable discussion. Okay, now uh, we, uh, we are going to have a round table discussion. I think a, uh, you have already uh, uh <clears throat> seen the, the point and comment from these experts. So I think in order to facilitate the discussions, I just uh, give you a very, very brief, you know, uh, the uh <coughs> a brief debriefing about a uh, each uh, expert, uh, the point they already mentioned, then we can connect, we can have a connected with the, the point and just the uh, uh, race. So I think uh, uh, Professor, Professor Lewis uh, uh, mentioned about the balance between the collective benefit and also individual autonomy, which is uh, very interesting. And, uh, and, uh, and I, will, uh, I, I will going to ask you, the first person to, you know, to to say something and comment about how did you think about you know your two key word about awareness and also responsibility, and Bing Zhengcheng proposed very very interesting historical viewpoint, including our Chinese viewpoint, uh, to 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 provide you know how we uh, how we look how we look at the crisis you know from history from historical viewpoint. And, to, and also to provide a new insight into the social distancing and also the, the isolation quality uh, from, uh, uh, from, from the historical viewpoint. I think it's very uh, uh, interesting. Professor Ma Yonghui proposed about immune passport is uh, ethical justifiable. Uh, that's a very important you know, issue. And Professor Roland <coughs> Uh, provide a very important decoloration and uh, also contemplation because of the social distancing and also the isolation. And uh, Professor, you know, Harlow, you know, also provide the uh, the the ethical argument, you know, for about the scale, the large scale testing, you know, uh, something like. And uh, Lawton also, Professor uh, Dr. Lawton uh, pr proposed about, you know how to use the arts and also you know, humanity in the management of the, this crisis. I think this is all the, uh, the point they already mentioned. And, and if, you, if, you, if you're on a website, you can go to website to go to the news and uh, go to the uh, short point, then you can see all the detailed comments I uh, just mentioned. So, I, so the following I, I will you know, uh, uh, do like, like this is I ask, uh, uh, the, I ask, I ask uh, one by one, you know, to have, uh, uh, to have comment about uh, this subject, and if you want to have uh, 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 the interaction with the, 
uh, with the discussion, you know, you just you just you just say say what you want, you know. But uh, uh, I will control the time, you know. And uh, I think this is the first time we use a long table discussion on online meeting, you know, to uh, make uh, this meeting uh, for the audience to listen the advice from experts. So I think following the the professor An's suggestion, uh, she asked one of the question is value in value in each country about. Uh, uh, about the response to the uh, to control the COVID-19, and uh, I think uh, uh, the first uh, I think the first the first one I invited would be uh, the uh, hey, uh, uh, Professor Lewis. You know, can you just uh, uh, just uh, <coughs> just start from your uh, comment, Lewis, please? Uh, me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you're you're asking me? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, because okay. I follow the value, value of the uh, responding to COVID-19 from Ang's speech. I think this is a very important, you know, uh, first question, yeah. So I ask you, because you, uh, your point already uh, uh, touched with uh, this uh, important, uh, you know, subject, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Professor Tony Chen. The, um, what I've been thinking about and uh, the, the conference by Professor Ann Gallagher touch this um, again, is when we discuss ethics, we are largely discussing something which is contextually based, and it relates to values. And um, my understanding of what's happening today is that the organization of the debate on values as probably or is probably changing. Uh, you, you have mentioned uh, words like solidarity and uh, engagement of people and so on. I do think that we are experiencing that in the current pandemic, but there is a difference in relation to previous catastrophic events, epidemics and even pandemics. And the big difference is that the majority of people in the world is actually taking what we could call the right option, which is, as you mentioned, to protect their own lives and the lives of their friends, their neighbors, everyone else. And they are, of course, aware of the economic impact of this, but nevertheless, they are making this fundamental choice first, as opposed to the governments, all the governments, which even when they take measures of confinement and so on, they are largely focused on the economic issues. And, and of course, they are doing what has always been done. So it's, and, and they are addressing a real, a real dimension, a real concern. And I've been asking myself, why is this happening? Uh, why aren't? Why is there such a contradiction? Um, part of the answer, I found it, in, or I think, can uh, eventually be found in the evolution of something many of us criticized in the recent past, which is individualism. If you push individualism to the extreme, you understand that the best way of serving your own interests is to keep people around you. So uh, individualism pushed to the extreme would lead to altruism. And um, it could be part of the answer. It could, in fact, if you are now, pres you are trying to preserve, this is what people are ask, asking for, save everyone's life, save all the life. Save all the lives means also save my life. Uh, don't put my life in danger. And, but this is a fundamental difference in relation to what would be collective approaches in the 20th century. Collective approaches in the 20th century were st or 19th century were statistical. The, the answer was statistical. So, okay, we, we won because only, uh, we had only, uh, I don't know, uh, half a million people dead. So it's a win situation. Uh, now people say it's a disaster because already half a million people died. 
And this is a, a difference of mindset. It's a difference of values. So one, one part of the answer I found it in this. I think it's pushing the, the individual into the extreme, but getting a, a positive outcome of it, not a negative one. And, and changing a, a, a top-down approach to, to collective interests into a bottom-up approach to collective interests. But something else came uh, uh, last week. I've, I've conduct, conducted with my stu students a survey on uh, responses of people in different contexts in different countries uh, to uh, various issues, including the issue of per perspective of happiness. One of the questions related to how do you compare your understanding of your own happiness about a year ago, so before the pandemic, and in three or five years time. And I was really, really surprised with the answers. Uh, uh, it's it's a, a, an online questionnaire. It's uh, combined with interviews to leaders, So, but it is not statistically valid. Nevertheless, because of course of all the constraints of the pandemic itself, but nevertheless, we got answers from European, Southern American, Asian countries, and African countries. And uh, what we can see at the first glance is that almost 100% of leaders, including political leaders, uh, cultural uh, institutions leaders, uh, academic leaders, professors in universities, business corporation leaders, Almost all of them say in three or five years' time, we will be worse. It will be very, very bad. So they are very negative about the immediate future. But when we ask people, and this, this is where the surprise comes, over 80% think they will be happier in, in three years' time. And I was puzzled with the results. And maybe this could be... Uh, could relate to the fact that everyone understands, well, first, everyone is saying for the last 20 years, things cannot go on as they are. This is a, a, a fundamental discussion. Whatever people think things should be, they have different, people have different ideas about the future, but there's a common, a growing understanding that things have to change. And the lives of individuals are always about adaptation. So people adapted very fast. And they found that they, despite all the difficulties, they can adapt. But institutions, and institutions include universities, they include museums, they include business corporations, they include hospitals, and they include government. Institutions have a greater difficulty. So my my doubt is maybe the institutions are looking for saving their own lives and they don't find out how, while people are finding how to solve their own individual life. And this contradiction, I, I, I think, again, in this study is not completely statistically valid. I, I will hopefully expand it and eventually with your collaboration in the near future. But nevertheless, I put it together with the first observation about individuals. And I think we are experiencing a difference of mindset, a cultural or even civilizational change. And in that case, of course, this would challenge the ethics. This would challenge everything we, we are used to, and uh, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. Uh, but for the moment, I would leave you with this observation. Thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, Luis, huh? Yeah, I think that's, that's a very interesting, uh, always very interesting question, particular after the post pandemic period, you know. I mean, in Taiwan, you know, we are very fortunate to have uh, experience of SARS. So uh, our government actually already have uh, regulation and policy for containing, you know, the COVID-19, you know. Uh, including social distancing and also uh, ask people to wear in, you know, to wear, you know, facial mask. I think, uh, uh, if Anne asked me about Taiwanese value, uh, I think, you know, our Taiwanese value as uh, 
is go to, I mean, is to go toward the collective, you know, uh, the collective, you know, approach uh, over than the individual approach. But I know, you know, in the world, you know, uh, people right now are, uh, are, are proposing about the, uh, how about the individual autonomy, you know. So I think this is a very uh, important point and uh, we can have, uh, uh, we can have uh, interactions. So uh, if you, uh, if you don't mind, I, I will take this advantage to expanding this uh, question to, you know, to, to relate it to the, how do we have uh, uh, such kind of the individualism? One of the things I think, you know, is, relate, is uh, relating to the economical development. So for business sense, you know, how to revive the business is always very important sense. So I know Professor Ma uh, Yonghui, uh, uh, she's, uh, she's also the expert in ethical, you know, uh, 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 field as well. And uh, uh, she already proposed uh, uh, the same point uh, I and the team already have uh, placed about the immune passport. You know. So the immune passport is uh, very, uh, right now, it's, uh, uh, it's one of the, one of the proposed idea for facilitating, you know, the business exchange, you know, after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So I will ask uh, uh, Ma Yonghui, uh, Professor Ma Yonghui, uh, can you uh, make a point? Yeah. Professor Ma, are you with us? Yes. Yeah, please. Hi, hello. Yeah, have you already? I'm Professor Tony. Yeah. Can you just make a Hello point everyone. about make a point about your comment? Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a great honor and a pleasure to join this wonderful meeting, and uh, I just learned so much from Anne's wonderful talk and also the Louis' very interesting uh, comments. Um, I I think that there's I I wanted to share some of the examples, some of the the cases in China. Uh, which I think resonates with Anne's slow ethics idea. Um, everybody knows that uh, COVID-19 was first, first found in, in China, in Wuhan city, Hubei province. And soon, because uh, there's a very rapid increase of um, the death uh, incidences and cases. So uh, a lot of doctors and nurses from other provinces travel to Wuhan to support and help. Um, in the city Xiamen, where I'm living and working, um, there are more than 500 nurses and doctors went to Wuhan to help. And I heard that there's a lot of many um, clinical trials going on. Uh, I think it's a uh, according to the res res register website in China, there's more than 400, 400 clinical trials has been registered um, and uh, conducted by a lot of uh, um, doctors and uh, investigators. So there's a lot of competition with the resources and also with patients. But unfortunately, be because there's too many clinical trials and not enough patients can be enrolled. So eventually, not many uh, very um, clean, uh, scientific um, uh, reports and fundings have been reported because not enough cases, uh, not enough samples. I think uh, that sh shows also the, you know, the competition among different medical institutions from other provinces and cities. There is a, uh, because they want to perform the best. Uh, they want to get, uh, get a, a good reputation on their clinical uh, expertise and treatment. Um, I think that that is uh, the case to reflect that we need to be, we need to, we don't need to be rushed and uh, not to always strive for the to be the the first and i also wanted to share uh, i'm afraid i uh, i think the 
resource allocation is also another very very important point very important uh and here i wanted to share some of the uh in among the chinese hospitals in the especially in the earlier days there is a lot of uh, um uh pressure on the resource allocation the hospitals had to consider a combination of factors age life expectancy how severe a patient illness is how likely treatment is to help and whether treat a patient has additional um, illnesses that could shorten the person's lifespan such as cancer or heart disease hospitals can then use those factors to develop scoring systems or clinical scores to prioritize care and some proposals like it necessary to place an age limit on access to intensive care for example 65 factors of um, social usefulness for example nurses but could other professions also be a factor or some uh, volunteers working in the community Hospital decision makers would have blinded information that prevented them from knowing details of a patient's source of payment, race, gender, and other personal details, unless it were clinically relevant. Some hospitals could adopt a lottery or first come, first serve system for triaging patients, but that might also mean someone less sick is, he, is treated before someone more sick, potentially failing to achieve the goal of saving the most lives. Guidelines are needed not just for determining which, patient, which patients to treat, but also how long to treat them. There's an article published on uh, New England Journal of Medicine proposed that uh, there are four ethical values for rationing health resources, maximize benefits, which uh, means to save the most lives and save the most life years, treat people equally, whether we should adopt a first come, first serve, is this a, a suitable for the, uh, under the COVID-19 pandemic or random selection. And there are also the um, value of promoting and rewarding instrumental values, which means that we should uh, uh, retrospective perspective would we should prioritize to those who have made relevant contributions and prospective means that we should prioritize to those who are likely to make relevant contributions and also give the priority to the worst of the sickest the first and the youngest the first i think uh, uh also in clinic, in clinic, there's a lot of uh, other issues. Can we remove a patient from a ventilator or an ICU bed to provide it to others in need? Undoubtedly, withdrawing ventilators from patients who arrived earlier to save those with better prognosis would be extremely psychological traumatic for clinicians. Some might refuse to do so. But many guidelines agree that decision to withdraw a scarce resource to save others is not an act of killing and does not require their patient's consent. In China, there's also a discussion about uh, uh, building and establishing a triage committee to make the ventilator allocation decisions um, treating doctors nurses or head of the hospitals or some we we also seen uh, from american that some political leaders who said that uh, old patients should uh, sacrifice to leave the possibility to younger patients or the uh, are the the institutional review board or some policy makers I think a triage committee uh, is very necessary, is uh, very important in making such a decision, uh, whether individuals or members of a team should be chosen by the institution based on a past record of trustfulness, 
trustworthiness, integrity, and passion com competency in making consistent and difficult choices, and also competency in clinical skills, especially in critical care medicine. Also, in the interest of fairness, consistency, and the coordination of efforts, we would suggest that government and local health department work with hospitals and each other to implement uniform triage processes for resource distribution using ethical considerations. I think uh, that that's the point I want to make, and uh, um, I would uh, save more time for the uh, for discussions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on the uh, optimum uh, management of the COVID-19 you know, experience in China and uh, to provide the triage community approach you know, to, uh, to do the, we call the precision you know, uh, science in management of the COVID-19. I mean, any, anything you know, right now, people are interested in the precision science in management of the COVID-19, including, including every expert. So I think, I, I think your thought is very similar to uh, the Anne already mentioned about in sufficient elevators. And uh, a, yeah, it's, it's a very another important medical ethical issues. But uh, I hope uh, other countries, uh, Anne or other countries can also uh, share our experience you know, later on. So let me go back to uh, the value of the, of the value, <coughs> the value of, of of the COVID response in over 19, you know, question from Luis and also the uh, uh, from Arms. So I will ask uh, uh, Rorit, can you just uh, 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 express your opinion about this, including your, you know, you already mentioned about the collaboration and also yeah, yeah, compensation, yeah. It's my turn. Yes, yes. please. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I was very impressed by the presentation of Anne and Luis as well, because he raised very important point. I have one remark, a two question addressed to Anne and to everybody. My, my remarks concern the strange things which happened in Switzerland. I was a member of the presidency of the Swiss National Research Fund, which is very important for the Swiss researchers. It allocated one billion Swiss francs every year, so it's a very huge uh, mechanism. But when the COVID-19 began to spread, the Swiss National Research Fund decided to put 20 million Swiss francs, and they decided to make a call of paper to uh, address some very important issue. And as humanities, coming from the humanities and with colleagues from philosophy, economy, from uh, history, archaeology, we are very surprised that nothing was said about humanities. It was only for the uh, epidemiologic, medicine, etc. for the serious, the huge science, and we, well, we asked the presidents of the SNF, well, what's happened? We, we have no, you don't mention humanities. Ah, oh, humanities is not important. Well, they say, yeah, of course, they say, yes, they are important, but they are urgent questions to ask and to address, and then humanities will be, they will be possible to, to be part of this uh, program. So, we address letters and letters to politicians to deem it. Humanities are part of the problem. It's not only a, a, a medical problem. And I think that's all interesting because in some, well, many of colleagues, it's not clear that humanities are so important. And we were very surprised. We think that was it was in evidence, but not at all. It, it is just... Uh, uh, well, we are still in the second place, at least in Switzerland. 
So this is my, my uh, first remark. And now I have two questions. I just read a French paper from coming from historian, and it was a paper which I evaluate, which tried to compare two uh, historical uh, situations. The first was in autumn 1914, when the Great War began, and they compared the situation to the uh, situation of spring 2020, when the COVID-19 uh, started to be important. And they tried to see how the politicians, the economic, the well, public opinion try to react to this uh, event. It is clear there are two different contexts. But what is interesting is that there is many similitar, similarities, similitude between these two different contexts, from a military one and second uh, sanitary one. And at the core of this text, there was a question I wish to address to Anne, because I was very interested by your concept of slowness in the, uh, in the reaction. My, my, my question is, can we be slow in an urgent situation? That is, we have to ask and, and to, to respond very urgently and for the public, for the politician, the government, it was clear we, we, from the public opinion, we expect response, and this response were to, to be put very urgently, and we, we don't want to wait. Of course, we can wait, and people died. So is there a difference between, we, or can we reconcile slowness uh, and urgency? I, I understand that is not, uh, urgency is not speed. I understand this. but. Can we reconcile these two uh, uh, concepts? Because it seems to me that very important that, well, we, 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 we expect from the politician for the, or for the researcher some uh, uh, answer which are very urgent. And my second question is about solidarity. And I, I agree with what uh, Louis said, said about individualism. But during this period, I was struck by the fact that mainly, mainly, the only response was national. Of course, there is exchanges between researchers about how to find a vaccine, information circulate. Of course, things, uh, such things happen. But I was struck that no, I, I see no international solidarity uh, uh, concerning the exchanges of nurses uh, from regions which are not very uh, concerned by the COVID-19. Why not to send nurses from this country to another? Uh, there was no exchanges about uh, doctors. Uh, it was a national response. And my concern, I, I, I was very struck that in, in fact, there is the deglobalization, and we can see again the borders becoming very important. And uh, uh, the only exception is about France. Uh, in March 19, uh, 2020, the French authorities decided to dispatch ill people to Germany to Luxembourg, to Austria, and to Switzerland. And in Switzerland, we, I think we received 40 French people who were ill. So this was a transnational response, but very concrete, right? to, to, to send ill people in, or in places where hospitals were still empty. So we have places to, to welcome this these people. So what do you think? I agree with you, but, but with what kind of solidarity? Is it just a national, a local, regional solidarity? What about the international uh, uh, solidarity? And I think it's a failure of um, to see how the European Union will address this issue. It was just egoism. It was just to defend 
as we said, uh, or ill uh, old people, and maybe after that we can have some uh, concern about the the other. So th that was the, the, the my remarks and my two questions. Thank you very much. Good. Two nice questions. So Anne, you want? Can I yes, ask please. Uh, yes, uh, thank yeah, you, Laurent. Yeah. Uh, very very um, thoughtful comments. Um, I mean, the first thing I was struck by your paper, um, the, the the comparison you said 1914 to 2020. In fact, I read Al Albert Camus' uh, The Plague, which I thought had a lot of res resonance with our time. Um, your two questions, uh, the first one about slow and an urgent situation, and the second one about solidarity. You rightly said my view of slow and the slow movement is not just about speed. It's about quality. It's about learning. It's about non-forgetfulness. Uh, so I think the way slow plays out, I mean, uh, Professor Chen has already mentioned SARS and Taiwan, and I've been in touch with a lot of Canadian colleagues who were certainly drawn on previous wisdom and expertise. I think the sadness is that the fast knee-jerk panic response stops people from learning or it, it means that they, they don't pay sufficient attention to what's gone before. So I think slow is necessary in an emergent situation because we need to learn from what has gone before. This is not the first pandemic, it will not be the last, but sometimes people appear as if it is the first and we have nothing to learn from what's gone before. So I think slow is totally pertinent. It's about depth, it's about remembering, it's about engaging with previous scholarship, it's about communication, it's about learning from others. We're not this, uh, you know, let's move quickly. So I think that uh, absolutely, I think slow has a very important place. Your second point about solidarity uh, is, is for, I think, the most part correct. However, the World Health Organization were very present and sadly some countries decided they had nothing to learn from the WHO. We don't have to name names, but that was very disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I also think in my own situation here, I, I, I don't know if this is, I hope it's, I don't know if it's been recorded, but I'm going to say it anyhow. Brexit is a very unfortunate situation. And certainly in the UK, Europe, the European community did offer the UK help with uh, PPE and, and it was rejected. And I thought that is so stupid. Uh, so I think uh, we have an expression here, you know, cut off your nose to spite your face. <laughs> I think sometimes great offers were not accepted. I, I definitely saw a lot of solidarity. And I think a very other important point is China did send supplies to Europe, yeah. ventilators, yeah. And, and let's not forget that. So I think there was a lot of cross-cultural reaching out. But sadly, yeah. our world, as we are, our politicians are not... Yeah sadly yeah. guided fully by solidarity and i wish it was more, but there was some evidence of solidarity but i'd say not enough so that's yeah. my response <laughs> <laughs> okay that's very interesting so thank you uh, Laura, you want okay, thank to you very much are you are you satisfied with all these two you know response or you want to have a uh, follow comment or not yeah sorry Laura, no. yeah Nolan. yeah sorry Okay, so if not, I mean, I I don't know. I I think you know, solidarity, uh, solidarity is so important. I mean, particular, you know, I have a man, I have a man come in earlier, you know, particular for nowadays we have a vaccine development, you know, I you know I just heard our dean, you know, make very good comment in the in the, in the, in Monday place, you know, if you don't have such approach as I propose, you know. But uh, you cannot have a very good vaccine. So can I ask uh, Dean Zhang to make some point about the, uh, how did you look, uh, how did you, uh, what's your opinion about, how did you use the international uh, effort to make the vaccine you know, develop very well rather than only in a regional or local approach, I think. Uh, because I made a comment earlier, you know, this is so important, you know, if you don't have uh, this element, and this element should follow the ethical guideline, you know. So uh, I think uh, that uh, that's the chance of, uh, of providing such kind of approach for international cooperation. So, uh, Dean, please, yeah. I, I think we are uh, 
uh, in, I think we are in a, in a uh, time of global pandemic. And as uh, previous uh, commentators has uh, mentioned uh, about this um, border control and the impact of this uh, on globalizations and cooperation among countries. And this is a very special uh, features of so-called global pandemic. I always uh, like to um, use this as a third word, word to describe the time we are in. But if you look, look back to the World War II or World War I, you actually have different alliance and they are controlling borders between the enemies, right? Right now, our common enemy is this coronavirus. But the way each country react is to control their borders against the rest of countries. It's a phenomenon we have never seen before. So when we impose this kind of restrictions and others become our enemies, that's what we are experiencing now. But we know if we want to defeat this common enemy, we have to work together. Then how can uh, enemies to work together to do this? So uh, that's, uh, I, I haven't found out the way, but I find a way because before we have machines, every non pharmaceutical interventions we are applying now, applying now, a kind of defense. We are kind of con contain ourselves, self quarantine ourselves, isolate ourselves from the rest of worlds to protect ourselves. So we are applying defense mechanism or defense strategy. But machine development applications is offensive measures. So this uh, would be uh, a turning point for us to come out of this defense mentality. And how to do that? My proposal is to loosen the border control. You know, this is the only way we can seek corporations in a solidarity mode rather than isolation mode. So how to do that? Who should do that? And I propose the countries with better control now. That means the country with no epidemic curve, like Taiwan and some other country, or has over already has the other side of epidemic curve, like New York State, like you know uh, Spain, Italy has already passed the curve and uh, on the and we have to open up this kind of uh, borders to the rest of world. So I I am a little bit disappointed at the EU's. EU in the begin starting from uh, last week opened up only travels within the second uh, you know visa free zone. They are still, re still, you know, obstructing the visitors from non second areas. It's not enough. So I think we have to step out of our mode of self-protection to lead the way, say, it's possible we can handle some kind of risk. We have to bear the risk, but we want to cooperate to make the society move again. And I think we can do that. If we can have this kind of uh, risk sharing from now on, then we can pour all the resource of risk sharing in vaccine development and application in the futures. You know, I be, uh, from my observation, we are going to have some kind of machines by the end of the year. <laughs> and with some kind of efficacy, and definitely have some risks of using this. 
some people will have some severe side effects of getting the vaccinations. And uh, we will come to this kind of uh, question, ethical questions. Who will get it? We will we require all the medical personnel to do that and uh, uh, for protections of themselves and the patients, potential patients you will see. So all of this is risk sharing. And the way we can share in risks is we have to open up our borders. It's impossible for us to still cross the borders. They say, we want to share risk. That's, uh, to me, is inhumane. That's impossible. It's against the human natures. So that's, I think, uh, we should come out from this lockdown mentality to open border mentality. And that's uh, takes people like us to advocate from a historical perspective, from uh, you know, um, humanistic perspective of view to, 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 to tell the world we have to do this. It's not a technical, it's not uh, you know, a scientific, uh, like uh, uh, machine developers or uh, philanthropists that can give this takes people's um, determination like us to say this is the way we have to share risk together and uh, probably we can gain the benefit together in an equal way. And uh, this has been uh, starting to uh, discuss now, right? We don't expect to have enough machines by the end of years. Who will get it? Will the country or the highest infected p cases get it first or the lowest? The richest or the poorest? The neediest or the one who can afford it? Right now, many, uh, I know many richest persons in Asia has already talked about uh, whoever can provide, they will fly and to be get vaccinated. It is allowed or not and will this market mechanism be enforced in the futures? Uh, when the first machine come out. So there's a lot of work we have to do, and uh, uh, this is my, my, my sharing with you. Thank you so much, and <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I think, yeah, I, I share the same thought about this, you know. Uh, I think uh, 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 solidarity, uh, solidarity at the international level is necessary for everything, you know, when you, when you, when you fight against the COVID-19. Yeah, I um, I also come back with uh, Lauren just mentioned about there's uh, seems that humility is uh, nowhere you know in the world you know this is very interesting but uh, don't forget that's why you know when you learn from the aunt's uh, uh, speech the first element is a sensitivity you know sensitivity is related to ask what the people need how can we help them. That's why we have a meeting here, you know, that's why we need a meeting, you know. So we have an online meeting, you know, in, I mean, wh whenever you have, we have a social distancing, we still get through this, you know, to have an online meeting to see each other and uh, even provide uh, some new thoughts and uh, from hum humility, hum humanistic approach for the audience, you know, around the world. So, yeah, I think this is so important from beginning uh, when we, when College of Public Health, National Taiwan University want to have these meetings, our, our dean and all, also our, you know, <coughs> the uh, uh, principal all, always encourage us, you know, we have to have such kind of viewpoints to have a humanistic approach. So, so, uh, so, Roland, I think, you know, we are, your, your comment is just to the point. I think that's why, you know, we have to make contributions. Also, I think, I have, a, I have a comment about the slow. I think the slow does not mean really slow. Slow means, you know, you try to, be, you try to use slow approach to become smart. Because if you don't ask the people, you know, what they think about, sometimes, you know, you provide some approach which people don't want. For example, I can also ask the uh, Roland about question if you make a comment about this is, you know, so many countries right now develop the digital contact tracing with app. They have uh, two types, centralized database, decentralized database, 
for example, Germany and Italy, they, they use decentralized and centralized database used in the Korea, in other countries. But people have so many concerns about privacy, about the equity, about the fairness. So I would like, you know, the all, all the experts, can you just say something about this? Because these are very important. And uh, from the ethical viewpoint, I think we have to we have to provide some guideline and also some thought about like the Professor An provided the six S element. You know, whenever you you want people to do the contact tracings, how would you like to you know how would you like to build the trust between people, government and also, you know, the stakeholders, you know. This is a very important question and uh, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, all of you can uh, can have uh, have an opinion about this, and uh, and uh, I ask uh, uh, Bin Zhen, you know, can you <laughs> just say something about this? You know, from your <laughs> historic, uh, always you know very good uh, history viewpoint. Yeah. All right, I'll try. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anne, for your lecture and. Um, uh, the colleagues who had um, make a very, very uh, important remarks. I want to uh, respond to Tony's question and Bin Zhang's uh, uh, points a bit by coming back, first of all, to Anne's uh, uh, um, speech on going slow um, and the slow movement, um, especially the, you know, the very, very interesting uh, input that Tony gave her right away uh, a few hours ago. You know, cultural linguistically, um, the Chinese world, of course, is not unique, but, uh, you know, many uh, 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 would share this kind of a, a, a characteristic. Like in, in daily usage in Chinese, if you say, if you send a friend uh, away, you said, 请慢走. Uh, please take your steps uh, slowly as you walk away. That's just so uh, well wishing, you know. Um, if you uh, are eating with people um, and you say, 请慢用, you know, uh, you never say <laughs> the other side. Yeah. You never, you know, and then, you know, whenever you see people moving about and doing anything, uh, oftentimes people say, my man lai, please. Please uh, uh, go slow, and there's no rush. Uh, right? Where it's it's uh, the remarks are not only about the physical speed, as uh, many uh, colleagues had pointed out. It's uh, about an attitude of um, uh, a composed uh, uh, thinking and well wishing. Uh, uh, you know uh, that would invite a, p a kind of uh, grace, um, so that. Uh, uh, you know, you see that in a lot of martial arts, uh, so martial arts could be competitive and fierce and quick. But the Tai Chi, you know, start with such slow motion. It's like the whole world become goes uh, slow motion. Uh, a few years ago, you know, um, we had a discussion in Hong Kong about slow cinema. Uh, 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 the Taiwanese uh, director, uh, Tsai Ming Liang, you know, had m many uh, prize winning uh, 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 film production on being slow, going slow. So these, I thought, were some sort of cultural uh, reflection or uh, reaction to modernity. Modernity basically is a 19th century thesis that banked on quickness, also banked on competition, and banked on national borders. You know, uh, so that that basically the nation state, um, you know, led to World War One, World War Two, and all these other things, right? Uh, uh, um, many had said that what we are um, in now is a fundamental stop sign. Well, stopped anyway, whether you agree or not. People are stopped, and once you're stopped, would people voluntarily pause? to, uh, that is, uh, uh, stop, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, so, so it's a stop because of anxiety and stress and the danger of counter, uh, 
contamination and other things for health reasons. But uh, you know, in front of uh, the crisis, if we're going to reimagine uh, how to take this, the first step uh, as a fresh start, um, we also say "请慢走." We also say, "Please go slow." Please, uh, 请慢用, please uh, take your, chew your food slowly, swallow it uh, slowly. Uh, uh, we also say, uh, you know, to, to enjoy and to taste uh, life, uh, uh, you know, a bit by a bit. Um, I think in terms of in a more uh, narrow sense, we certainly see the realignment of disciplines. Uh, you know, we, I think all of the disciplinary boundaries were established by the 19th century and early 20th century uh, views. So that, you know, humanities social sciences would well be on one side, lab sciences, physical sciences, applied sciences such as uh, biomedicine and public health would be on the other side. We have to cross the border uh, uh, to have activities like this. It took our colleagues here, uh, tens of years uh, uh, to get uh, to where we are, that we could actually be sitting in a, in a one room and engaging all of our colleagues and friends as if they're real colleagues, as if the departments and the schools uh, uh, might not stop us from working together and having a real conversation. I think for the young peoples in their choices of life, uh, uh, you will see that. They will begin to see because of the crisis, maybe as uh, Luran has said, border crossing would have to be allowed, some sort of balancing of, uh, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, I said last time in April, we have to have a structured built-in position for all disciplines and then even uh, with enemies. I hope we would not see them as enemies, but you s if you read your news uh, every day, unfortunately that's that. And so I'm leading to two questions to all. One is the discursive term that many refer to, that there's got to be a change, uh, whether people welcome that or not. Uh, uh, you know, we don't want a real hot war, uh, but some of the confrontations and conflicts and uh, policies were coming very close to that in terms of animosity, hostility, and, and the pr pushing people out, uh, you know, unsharing of resources and other things. So the discursive term, how um, could, could people in a very direct way, um, you know, be allowed to return to the basics of lives? Uh, because if physical survival uh, it's becoming a, a problem, as uh, Dean Zhan had just very uh, succinctly pointed out, you know, simply by stopping things will be a very, very passive and non-constructive way uh, for the next step, right? It's, it's, it's uh, I won't want to say negative, but it's not the most helpful uh, in terms of uh, either developing a uh, the medication or other things. And also, you know, uh, many of the colleagues urge us to take a longitudinal view when we imagine the new beginning. If it, it's certainly, you know, people are looking at things from day to day and trying to prevent this or stop that. But if we were to really take a long gaze, um, then, you know, uh, 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 would that, uh, uh, allow us to make a more a meaningful way of uh, 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 going slow and, and making use of the stop sign. Uh, stop and therefore what? If we're going to stop, be stopped, and then go on with the old ways, mm -hmm. then the, the stop sign, like your red line, doesn't do a thing uh, in terms of uh, protecting you from the danger and setting you off to uh, safety, if we're going to say safety means "请慢走," go slow, uh, so that you won't tumble and you won't fall. Yeah, thank you.
mentioned earlier, uh, immune passport is very important, you know. So, uh, so I think uh, this is a uh, this is also uh, uh, fit in with uh, uh, no border, you know, in, in the in, in the futures, you know, to have a global uh, globalization, you know. I think uh, Nolan actually mentioned uh, in uh, in his comments uh, also as well, you know. So. Uh, yeah, I I want to ask Dalton, uh, uh, can you express your opinion about, <laughs> I mean, what we already mentioned about, you know, the global, you know, the the deglobalization problem and uh, you know the uh, ethical uh, problem and also you know a uh, solidarity everything, you know, you want to say something about because in your point you already mentioned. Uh, maybe uh, perhaps you know the art and the also the humanity can help you know in the management of you know this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, I want your opinion. Yeah, can you just talk about that? Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Hello. Good. Good sure. afternoon. Good evening for yes, you. Yes. 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 <laughs> and, yeah. And can you he hear me and see yes, me now? Yes. Very clearly. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. And so um, I uh, I was thinking of suggesting a few points related to this uh, ethical uh, 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 implications. And um, perhaps it might be surprising that I'm also uh, here. And uh, especially th this is why I'm particularly um, uh, grateful for the invitation so that I can um, uh, participate. And thank you again for inviting me for the second time. I very much enjoyed also the the first uh, meeting in uh, April. And uh, at first sight, it may be a bit surprising uh, for me talking here as an art historian and, and uh, teacher of uh, aesthetics and philosophy of art, because um, it, it might look that I am the most distant um, from the uh, medical issues or medical considerations. And in, in a way, it is true, because of course, uh, the um, uh, art and uh, aesthetic as discipline uh, may be uh, treated as secondary uh, when it is about the actual healing. So the looking for the uh, uh, medicine or the vaccine against the virus and so on. So from a medical point of view, uh, obviously we cannot directly contribute with our uh, insights and um, uh, with our research. But actually, there is one aspect where uh, we, as uh, scholars of humanities and more uh, particularly uh, working, uh, those working in art, can uh, directly contribute. And, uh, where, uh, and that is the question of, uh, of um, what uh, the people uh, do uh, during the uh, lockdown and what they can do uh, during the lockdown. So. Of course, it's quite a difficult question because for many uh, people or many even entire countries, uh, it is a completely new experience, or at least for many generations, especially for uh, young people who have not experienced something um, like this earlier. That that was also mentioned by um, several of the previous uh, speakers. That uh, for many it's something new that the borders are closed, or that you cannot le uh, leave even your own uh, apartment for days or for several uh, continuous and long uh, periods. So um, th this is why it's, uh, for me, especially it's a particularly interesting question that um, so what do people do and what can they do during the lockdown as a novel experience? And as I mentioned in my talk in, in April, we can see that there is a sudden increase um, uh, of uh, the digital consumption of uh, culture, every type and every sort of uh, culture, I mean. So uh, people started to go to um, uh, museums, exhibitions online. Many of them, uh, perhaps for the first time, or at least they started to view those sort or those type of content that normally uh, perhaps they, they would not have uh, uh, gone there um, uh, physically. So like uh, gaining novel experience, novel uh, cultural content. And uh, at the same time, this also triggered uh, the new and new creative um, uh, approaches and ideas from the artist's uh, side and also from the gallerist or museum managers, curators, 
art fair organizer and so on. So we, uh, we, we could see and we can still see a wide array of uh, online exhibitions or home streaming of uh, dance performances. Uh, you can also regularly see me like uh, the, uh, uh, even in, in um, uh, mainstream news channels when they report on like ballet dancers practicing or or even performing from their own living room or kitchen and so on and uh, we can also see like a video conference style uh, concerts or choir uh, presentations and so on so uh, I think uh, this is a very interesting initiative, a very novel experience for many, and uh, here is how we arrive uh, to the uh, ethical consequences of all this, because uh, obviously these artists, uh, these performers or these creative individuals need to be supported or must be supported uh, both by the public uh, somehow and uh, on a national or governmental uh, level, because they are doing public uh, benefit, even if uh, in an unusual uh, uh, context, or so not in like uh, within the uh, uh, framework of a traditional art gallery or museum or performing hall or uh, theater and so on. Um, and uh, this is why I mentioned that the ethical implications um, are uh, kind of two directional because uh, the, the state or the country or the go uh, government expects the citizens to stay at home to respect the uh, rules of the curfew or uh, the, the uh, lockdown and the, uh, the quarantine and so on. Um, but at the same time, uh, for those uh, for whom it's a novel experience, there must be something um, um, provided or helped uh, to pass uh, the, uh, this time at home, especially if they are not uh, like, prepared for this experience. So uh, it's a little bit like, uh, so just like many countries uh, provided uh, like in uh, free internet access for the students so that they can continue their online education or they give uh, computers or, or tablets for the students uh, in every household or every family so that they, they can follow the lessons. Uh, something similar uh, happens and, and should happen uh, with the artists as well. So they should be um, uh, like uh, provided some kind of support because they are uh, helping uh, people in in their uh, lockdown um, time. And so uh, I think um, uh, the the consideration of, of these uh, questions uh, could lead to multiple uh, uh, benefits. So it's not only merely a novel form of enjoying art or uh, providing a meaningful pastime, but it also largely contributes to the education uh, during uh, the uh, con containment. And a little bit uh, reflecting to the other main um, question that very often comes up in this, um, I mean, today's uh, presentation is the question of the slow, uh, slowness. This is a consequence that we will need to, um, like, uh, um, uh, see uh, how it will affect uh, the art world in general, because uh, before the lockdown, before the, the virus, uh, there has been really a huge uh, like um, uh, din uh, dynamism and, and buzz um, around the, uh, for example, the art fairs or the um, uh, biennials and all these mega exhibitions and those specialized and, and those interested in art very often traveled for these mega events. And uh, naturally, it is quite likely uh, that uh, after the experience of the pandemic, uh, uh, some uh, part of the public will realize that uh, it is not necessary, uh, necessary to uh, physically attend each and every of these uh, events. Uh, even before the lockdown, there uh, used to be a very often circulating uh, expression uh, for, uh, from the professional curators and uh, art collectors. It was a kind of a word joke because it said uh, fair thing. So just, just like fatigue or tiredness is the fair thing. The, uh, art fair tiredness because every week they had to travel somewhere to see a new uh, art fair or art uh, exhibition and uh, they 
started to complain that they simply cannot take uh, all this uh, travel and the uh, visual and aesthetic experience because it was like uh, continuously um, affecting them. And uh, perhaps uh, the experience of, of the uh, slowness of the world, how it is now, uh, will change this aspect of the um, uh, art world and the infrastructure of the art as well. So uh, actually these are the few points that I wanted to um, uh, add um, to the round table. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think <laughs> talking about the experience of lockdown, lockdown is always, you know, a very good uh, negative, you know, experience. I, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, because in Taiwan we, 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 we have very uh, have good control about uh, the COVID-19, so uh, we don't have that such an experience. But I think, I think, I think this, uh, this is actually the, the question about uh, not only lockdown, but you see, you know, when you say lockdown and uh, quarantine, isolation, uh, social distancing, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, wear facial mask, you know, something, this, all the things, you know, social distancing uh, correctly, uh, it's always related to the value, you know, we mentioned earlier <laughs> about what is the value about, you know, of, of <laughs> responding uh, COVID-19 crisis, you know. So I think, I mean, right now, as far as I know, less than one third country right, right now <laughs> have uh, locked down, you know, <laughs> countries. I, I, as I, understand. I mean, in the USA, you can see there's no lockdown. I mean, almost there's no lockdown. As far as I know, that's why, that's why we we are talking about you know different things you know after the COVID nineteen pandemic you know, so so whenever the COVID nineteen pandemic evolve you know they have a different uh, issue emerging you know so 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 but but of course I have seen so many narratives about the experience of lockdown from different countries you know, uh, maybe you know, uh, Luis and also. <laughs> And also, uh, you, you can share his experience about this lockdown, you know, something like that. I mean, Bin Zheng can also <laughs> share with us as well, you know. So, Luis, how about you say something about this? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, the sound on your side is very low, but if I understood you were uh, asking about the reactions about the lockdown, is it? Okay, it's clear right now? Uh, now it's better. Can you repeat, please? Because I... I yeah, I, yeah. It doesn't just mention about the lockdown, you know, experience, lockdown experience. But, uh, you know, uh, as far as I know, uh, in the world right now, uh, less and less countries have... Uh, lockdown, you know, policy, you know, so in the USA, oh, yeah. you see, you know, I mean, uh, almost no, no region <laughs> has, has a lockdown right now, you know, so, but the, the experience for, of lockdown, of course, is very good relatives, you know, for our history and our, our uh, <coughs> anthropology, you know, viewpoint, you know, so, yeah. so, but this is always related to the value you mentioned earlier, uh, 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 from Ann and you, you know, about, what is the value of the you know the COVID nineteen yeah. you know response? Yeah. So just just mention again for uh, to the audience. Yeah. Yes, I, 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 I yes, it's true. We we have uh, very few cases of lockdown in this moment, and more than that, uh, people that experienced lockdown uh, were tired. Were uh, felt uh, growing levels of anxiety. We have uh, seen we are, there are some indicators of uh, growing tension, uh, individual tension, uh, leading, for example, to uh, uh, rise in domestic violence, rise in child abuse, um, also um, problems related to depression, sometimes suicide. So there are several negative aspects which are obviously uh, resulting from, from the lockdown. On the other hand, the lockdown is still the approach that people take whenever they see the pandemic uh, grow again. And I'm not talking about the states. We don't have lockdown in Portugal, for example. But many people, 
uh, after having uh, when when the state of emergency uh, ended and people started to circulate again um, when they saw that in some areas there is a rise a significant rise in the number of infected people and uh, again uh, health issues you see that at least in those neighborhoods the number of people circulating in the streets dramatically decreased again so after a moment when they were uh, moving uh, around they went back home uh, they're doing that because that's the only strategy they find not because they like it but of course it's the only strategy in face of a disease that no one else knows very well how to cope with despite the efforts of the government to bring people out to to make people circulate lisbon for example the portuguese government decided yesterday that after having allowed to have meetings of 20 people they went back down to maximum 10 people since from today uh, and they have done that because we have uh, bigger numbers of uh, illness now than uh, two months ago what for me is um, interesting again in this case is uh, that people stick basically to the same response despite all the negative aspects including psychological not only economic of the lockdown and the precaution measures uh, going around with with masks is of course not the most pleasant thing in the world although in asia uh, many colleagues are used to it but of course you know it's it's not a funny thing to do it's it's not only uh, uh, something which is not ple uh, pleasant but it's also something that creates uh, a frontier a, a difficulty in human interaction because you don't see the face of the other you you, you cannot recognize you cannot anticipate the mood um, you cannot easily create empathy and so on so uh, what is for me relevant is are there many people not paying attention now to the uh, safety measures yes there is an important minority maybe around 15 20 percent of people who don't pay attention is this the attitude of the majority no 80 percent or something like that of the people even more in countries like portugal stick to the same basic attitude we protect life. We follow the basics of protecting everyone's life. And this is amazing. This is amazing. It's, is it sustainable? No. And, and something just before I finish, you were discussing uh, a few minutes or some time ago about the fact that, that states had basically have a, a nation, a national approach to something which is global, which is the pandemic. And you are absolutely right, the colleagues who mentioned that uh, the states, in face of something which is of this scale, even in, in regions where there are cooperation and integration mechanisms like the European Union, have chosen to have national approaches, which don't make much sense. Uh, uh, why should a country like the United States or even Portugal have the same policy for all the, its international relations when it, and also the same policy within the country when there are different cases uh, in different situations in the country but why is this happening my reading again is that institutions are incapable of dealing with this all the institutions including the national governments because the reference is an economic model which is challenged by the combination of the pandemic with a new set of values and while they will all corporations ngos governments try to stick to the preservation of this economic model they will continue to be uh, constrained to do the same thing which is a disaster there is no possibility of a national response to the pandemic and i think that the, the intelligent although inorganic response is the one people are taking but of course it requires more than that we cannot simply stay at home we need to redesign economic and human interaction and this i think uh, public policies are in this moment blocking that 
And this is, this is a major concern. Thank you so much, Luis. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I think we have, a, we have a final question from uh, the Anne's question about, she mentioned about scholarships, you know, uh, a point on how important it is to invite, you know, other disciplines, you know, including a particular history and anthropology, you know, and so on, people to join with the uh, uh, to have uh, denied, you know, the uh, ethical guideline and also ethical aspect. So I think this is very important as well. That's why, you know, today the subject we want to emphasize on the uh, ethical issues, uh, uh, particularly after the uh, the uh, pandemic. Yeah. So I will ask, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lauren, can you make a comment about this, you know? Roland, are you here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Have you have you already? Uh, yeah, have you but already I have some problem have with you connection. Yeah. You have you already this? heard the, my question? Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you repeat? Please? Yeah, yeah. I just I just want to you make a comment about Ans, uh, Ans, uh question about how important it is to ask the other disciplined people to to join with uh, oh. the you know the the ethical guideline you know. Something like that. Yes, it, it's, it's very important for humanities. Uh, this is all my point. It's why I'm in SIPS, because uh, we defend humanities. And what happened in Switzerland was with, with this call for paper was, well, was astonishing. How, how we, we have to, to, to think, uh, of course, about interdisciplinarity, but in all sense, not only compartment of human science in one side and medicine in other side and epidemiology here and here no and and i think this uh, epidemic this pandemic is remarkable for that because it asks the question we are to think about globally we we, we can imagine now to just to think about a vaccine it is impossible we have not found the vaccine and we don't know when this vaccine will come up Don't, Humanities are inside the problem. They are part of the problem. It's not a medical problem, a health problem. Health problems are humanities, of course. And my, my answer is, of course, we have to think about in an inter interdisciplinary way. That's a banal thing, but we have to put in concrete things. This is how, how to imagine now the future of science is not many disciplines. It, it, it is main discipline with different approaches and views. So my, my, my answer is without this uh, vision of a new scientific world, as Louis mentioned for the economic dimension, I agree totally with, with him, but we have to think uh, uh, about the same way for the uh, scientific uh, dimension. And, and I think this is the main lesson from this uh, 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 pandemic, COVID-19. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think Tom is going to <laughs> to up to uh, end up uh, to end this uh, roundtable discussion. But uh, before that, I want to ask uh, Professor uh, Ann Garifo, could you want to make an overall comment about this section? Yeah, because you know after your speech, we have. Uh, several subjects, you know, uh, already discussed, and uh, I want to hear you about the overall comment about this, you know, to the audience, you know, if possible. Yeah. Um, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. I'll keep it very brief. Um, no, thank you all. Incredibly illuminating, thoughtful, interesting uh, comments and responses, and I definitely feel wiser as a result of being part of this so, so thank you all um i particularly liked uh yeah laurent louis i mean all of your comments and ping chen's uh references to cross-cultural perspectives on slow and uh thank you that's given me another avenue that i need to explore um i mean i suppose my takeaway is uh, this pandemic is characterized by unpredictability and uncertainty we I'm not sure any country has it exactly right, but I think 
it's very important to learn from each other. And I think today's uh, online conference has been, for me, very, very fruitful and very, very helpful to hear the, the views of, of so many colleagues from different disciplines. So, yeah, I think more of this. I mean, I, it would be lovely if more of your work, your scholarship could be more accessible through the media. I think people do become very uh, narrow in their outlook. And I think it's incredibly complex. You know, your, your references to the economy and health, of course, these things are related. Louise reference to domestic violence and child abuse. I mean, at the moment, we need to think about class differences and economic differentials. So, yeah, I, I think what this uh, event has done for me is just even, I suppose, increase my awareness of the complexity, but, but most importantly, the value of this interdisciplinary cross-cultural engagement. And, and Tony and Ping Chen and colleagues, I'm just very grateful to have been part of this. And I just want to say thank you very much. And I look forward to future conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. And uh, I also want to share a close culture. You know, I already told you about, you know, man gong chu xi huo. It's uh, in English is uh, soft file makes a sweet mold. You know, so this is uh, actually uh, very interesting about your slow ethics. And thank you again about your, you know, wonderful speech and uh, leading to this uh, very uh, meaningful uh, round table discussion. Yeah, and uh, I think we, we are going to end this section, and uh, I think uh, uh, the remaining time, I think we will ask uh, uh, Louis and Binzhen and uh, me to uh, give us some summary about uh, the, uh, the overall uh, the uh, online meeting uh, this time, and also maybe uh, the next time, Binzhen maybe talk about a little bit about the August, and uh, I will talk about, and Louis, probably you can talk about the viewpoint about from the ships, you know. So, so you just uh, summarize, and finally, I will ask my team to uh, close, you know, this uh, 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 this online meeting. So, Louis, again, <laughs> please, uh, you first, yeah. Thank you very much, Tony. Sure. Uh, I, I, I don't have much to say. Uh, I think we had a, a very, very interesting discussion uh, uh, today. Uh, following the previous debate, I think we went deeper into these ethical issues. And, and it's particularly important, this topic, because out of all the topics of relation between uh, humanities and health, uh, the one the society is more sensitive, I would say, more open to take into account is the discussion on ethics. So we should actually build from that. I, I, I thank very much Anne Gallagher for the wonderful uh, introduction she made. Um, and I, I, I would conclude saying what I, I often say, I said it before earlier today, I think we need to publish. I think we need to, to summarize the, the, the debate, uh, the topics, and um, if not uh, in this session, I think in the near future, it would be nice to have a publication compiling the different contributions, the one in April, now this one, and maybe a next one as well, and then summarize a certain number of observations, recommendations to, to send to send to SIPSH first, and then SIPSH can, uh, but also to UNESCO, and then SIPSH can help disseminating those recommendations. Not exactly a program. We, we heard uh, a diversity of approaches here, and we are not certainly looking for a, a, a monochordic approach to whatever. So we, we, we want to keep this diversity. Uh, but precisely, I think Anne uh, made a, a fantastic uh, uh, point here uh, that uh, many here uh, took again. Is it possible, as, as Laurent said at some stage, is it possible to go slow, slow when everyone is running? Well, you simply ask uh, what animals do in the forest. Those who don't stop to look first, normally they die. Animals don't simply run when there is a fire. I know that because I've been in fire. They, they run when they know where to run. And, and uh, sometimes, of course, they think too long and they die anyway. That's life. 
uh, and of course some of us have the task of running in a society it's like this we we divide us so it's normal that some will be running but as long as they run knowing uh, they are waiting for someone else to point them in, in a safe into a safer direction and the point we have today is that all the leaders are running and that's not a good way to prepare the future okay thanks yeah thank you Vincent. Yeah. thank you tony um, and um, thank you, uh, uh, Anne and Louisa, for all the good remarks. Um, I think uh, representing, you know, Anne and Chen, and our, you know, we are co-organizing this. Um, I uh, would like to um, share with you that with this discussion for the first uh, day, first half day, on um, the implications of containment. Uh, you know, the challenge it produced for questions related to privacy, equality, and fairness. Uh, naturally, tomorrow, we have another half day to talk about differences. Uh, we are very fortunate to be able to uh, have uh, David Goldberg, uh, who's a um, uh, specialist on racism, originally from South um, uh, Africa, Produced uh, many books that some were being were are some are being translated now. Uh, he's situated uh, in California, um, you know, one of the major uh, uh, sort of um, uh, hot spots of uh, uh, problems. Then we have Ann Watner, who's the history chair of uh, Minnesota University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Uh, where riots and violence uh, and protests, the terror of, uh, um, uh, you know, the protests of uh, state and protests of terror continued. Uh, so I think we're completely fortunate, we're, we're very fortunate that we not only survived, uh, we got uh, the opportunity to be able to discuss together uh, uh, and then to have this uh, share this conversation um, which is uh, more than merely making it um, the Louise's reminder is very important that we share this whether it was online publishing or other things so that others who may not be able to spare the moment to think will be able to uh, hear what we have exchanged. And then tomorrow, we will continue to have a conversation about segregation, about difference, about prejudice, about all of the human difficulties and problems uh, that um, are uh, with us. Taipei and Taiwan currently are fortunate. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we're not in the same uh, uh, situation with everybody else, because eventually when borders open up, uh, you know, everybody else's <laughs> problem will be our problem. I hope that our safety and comfort will be everybody else's uh, 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 future too. Thank you very much for the conversation. Thank you. Uh, finally, uh, I think, <laughs> Uh, when I take this job to uh, use the he health of humanity and uh, to <coughs> to become the subject of the planting health, uh, at the beginning I never expect, you know, we have such kind of meeting uh, to have, uh, you know, COVID-19. But I think, you know, the trend and also the uh, the global growth are just the same, you know, because planet health actually is to pursue the global health. I always learn from our Dean, you know, uh, experience. So I, I would like to say, a because we have such kind of crisis, we have to help with each others without borders. So in the April meetings, actually, at that time, we have uh, urgent issues.
to do is to contain, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we uh, we we introduced many kind of the containment management uh, with pros and cons to communicate with people actually from the humanity viewpoint. As as far as I can see, uh, many people actually uh, feedback have a feedback to me at, at that time. The meeting actually is quite successful for sending messages to prepare the uh <coughs> prepare their, res their 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 response when they have been locked down or ha have been quarantined and isolated but time goes by right now in june meetings we are faced with different issues as i mentioned uh earlier and uh, that's why we narrow down to the subject about the ethical issues. Why this is so important? I can tell you, if we don't have such kind of the guidance, such as the uh, the the Professor Gellerford already provide, you know, about 6S, something like that, you know, research has always still, you know, use the conventional way of doing the uh, the discovery and also the, the 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 research findings, they are really very slow. You know, I mean, I can show you with the experience of applying for the IRB about the grantship, about everything in the academical. We are slow, and the ESC is not slow, but academical. On this point, very slow, but people die at the same time. So how can we, how can, how can we? How can we behave as scientists to overlook such a phenomenon without any humanist viewpoint? That's why I and my dean decide to have this, you know, uh, uh, I important, you know, uh, the uh, topical on this. I can tell you also following the digital contact tracing app. Again, so many resources available to do that. If you don't have follow the 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 ethical guidelines. You don't close the you don't you know you you are not close to the people and you your app will not you know will not be useful. So you a waste of these sources I mentioned earlier. So it's not only for humility but also for uh, waste of time and resources because people don't like it because people think they don't they don't be they don't be respected you know by privacy you know the equity and the also fairness. This is a so important principle. So, so that's why we need this uh, the uh, platform and uh, using this uh, humanity, you know, meeting to uh, ask the people from academical, from the government, from from uh, enterprise to facilitate, you know, the international uh, uh, cooperation levels in terms of the solidarity we already mentioned about. Uh, from Dean and also from uh, the uh, Professor uh, Gallifo, you know, uh, lecture. So I I think you know uh, this is my uh, summary about uh, my feeling about this meeting and sharing with our audience. And uh, of course, I I I, I totally agree with uh, Louis about we have to publish and we have to you know to uh, to to uh, to provide this uh, summary. And also the uh, the discussion point somewhere uh, in order to uh, to achieve the purpose I just mentioned, and uh, we are trying to do that, and uh, we do our best in order to reach uh, the uh, uh, professor. You know, uh, Tiso just mentioned we have to uh, put on humility. You know, in the front page. You know, to emphasize how important it is. You know, when we are faced with such a crisis. And finally, uh, I thank you for being there to uh, introduce the. Uh, we still have uh, 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 the uh, tomorrow meeting uh, about very important issue uh, in the USA, in the in 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 the in the world about uh, something about you know xenophobia, uh, you know violence and, and and so on. And I will because time long uh, is different, so I will ask our team and our college. You know, to uh, provide this live show for all experts to 
uh, to look at after the meeting. If you have time, then you can have a feedback to uh, this uh, the topical, uh, which I think is very important uh, right now. You know, so uh, I think I is I I I feel very uh, grateful for uh, every uh, the expert and also the audience participant. Uh, I I have to say we we have also the participants from Asian country, including uh, the uh, Indonesian, Indian, Malaysia, and Thai, and also the Hong Kong and and so on. You know, to uh, join with our meetings, they will give me uh, feedback later on. And uh, uh, thank you so much again to join this meeting. So finally, I ask my dean to close. You know. Uh, to give a closing remark about this online meeting, then we hope we have uh, uh, next time that I can uh, make contribution to these meetings. Dean, please. So, dear friends, on behalf of National Taiwan University College of Public Health, I want to thank you to make efforts uh, to make this online conference possible. And I also want to thank you for your uh, time to participate in today's conference. Uh, although uh, Tony and I has already uh, organized this for months to have an in-person uh, conference in Taiwan, and uh, we are still looking forward to see the possibility in the coming futures. We really like uh, to have um, an in-person conference in the futures in the new normal society, which we don't know what kind of new conference will be. But we like to it to be uh, physically uh, pre uh, held in Taiwan uh, in some forms. Uh, but today, I think we all learn a lot from each other. And uh, tomorrow, we have uh, another day. And uh, if, uh, if you have time, we uh, welcome you to join us live. If you don't have time, and as Tony said, we also provide you the recorded uh, videos uh, that uh, will facilitate uh, further communication among us. And I totally agree with Rui's comment. We will uh, definitely publish uh, what we have uh, discussed uh, in April and now in June and um, keep this kind of dialogue ongoing and together with ongoing pandemic. I think that's uh, our uh, sense of mission to uh, save ourselves and save the world. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Please, please wait a minute. Uh, we would like to have a group photo. Group photo. Yeah. Uh, so How can you do that? Yeah. Could you please turn on your camera? Please. Everyone turn on your camera. We want to photo, photo <laughs> through the online. so much bye bye everyone